Matthew 22 records a series of hard-hitting verbal reprimands and instruction that Jesus had with some representatives of the temple organization and others from the synagogue organization. Now, generally speaking, these two organizations were populated and led by members of two different religious, political, social sects. The temple was led by the Sadducees. The synagogue was led by the Pharisees. They had quite different doctrines that they each abided by. And so the two groups remained in, in constant tension with one another. Except here, <laughs> we find them teaming up to try to trip up Christ in order to discredit him or even to do away with him if they could find a way. Now, as we saw last time, chapter 22 kicks off with a parable that leads us to a principle about what the kingdom of heaven is like. And it involved a king holding a wedding banquet for his son. But the invited guests brazenly refused to come. Now it's understood that these guests were the wealthy, the influential, the aristocrats, those that were highest up on the social ladder. And the reason for their refusals, well, there were several, none of which lists any particular animosity towards the king or his son. It was just simply their indifference. Their indifference. Their excuses all revolved around things these various groups of invited guests either held as more important in their lives or they, they just preferred to attend to something else that pleased them more. And the parable is shocking to the Jewish listeners because there is little more socially important than a wedding. And an invite to a wedding is more than a suggestion. It's an obligation. And since the shame and honor system was still embedded in Jewish society, then to not attend was a great slap in the face. It damaged the king's honor, while at the same time, it exposed those tardy guests as having poor character. Now, the king was not about to have his son's wedding banquet to go unattended. So, he sent servants out to invite the common folks in at, at random. And their moral or ethical condition was not to be examined. It wasn't to be used as a determining factor in who was invited. And as the king inspected this unusual mixed bag of guests, one in particular stood out because he was not wearing the required wedding garment that everyone knew was to be worn for such an important occasion. And the man was bound, he was thrown out, of the wedding banquet into an evil darkness. Now, the moral of the story is, for many are invited, but few are chosen. Now, let me expand upon that. Since the parable is meant to explain one aspect of what the kingdom of heaven is like, then we are to understand that in the kingdom of heaven, virtually all are invited to enter. So far, the all only means Jews. All right? Sinners, the righteous, the rich, the poor, criminals, those who abide by the law. However, there are entrance requirements, and that is symbolized by the need to wear the proper garment in preparation to be admitted. Now, all who are invited are called the many, but the few that are chosen are those who show up properly prepared for the occasion. 
So there's a definite sorting process going on here. Uh, let us remember the scene. Yeshua is still on the temple grounds, jousting with the head priest, which may or may not mean the high priest, and with some Pharisees who are not approaching him in a sincere way, but rather they're only trying to find a means to discredit him or kill him. Now, this parable was aimed at them. They were depicted as those indifferent guests who were invited, but they didn't show up for the wedding banquet. The religious leadership, they were infuriated at this blatant attack upon their integrity. So they stomped off and they met together to formulate yet another attempt to trap Yeshua. And that attempt results in the famous, given to Caesar, that which is Caesar's proverb. Let's read about it. Open your Bibles to Matthew 22. Matthew 22, we're going to start reading at verse 15 and go to verse 22. So it's Matthew chapter 22, starting at verse 15. The Parshim, the Pharisees, went away and put together a plan to trap Yeshua with his own words. They sent him some of their Talmudim, the disciples, and some members of Herod's party, and they said, Rabbi, we know that you tell the truth and really teach what God's way is. You aren't concerned with what other, what other people think about you since you pay no attention to a person's status. So, tell us your opinion. Does Torah permit paying taxes to the Roman emperor or not? Yeshua, however, knowing their malicious intent, said, Well, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used to pay the tax. They brought him a denarius. And he asked them, Whose name and picture are these? The emperors, they replied. And Yeshua said to them, No. Give the emperor what belongs to the emperor. Give to God what belongs to God. And on hearing this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. <clears throat> now, the same story is told in Mark chapter 12. I'd like you to just turn your Bibles just a few pages over to Mark chapter 12, and we're going to read just like four or five verses there, starting at verse 13. Same story. Mark chapter 12, starting at verse 13. Next, they sent some parushim, some members of Herod's party, to him in order to trap him with a shelah. A question. They came and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you tell the truth. You are not concerned with what people think about you since you pay no attention to a person's status but really teach what God's way is. Does Torah say that taxes are to be paid to the Roman emperor or not? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why are you trying to trap me? Bring me a denarius so I can look at it. And they brought one, and he asked them, Whose name and picture are these? The emperors, they replied. Yeshua said, Give the emperor what belongs to the emperor. Give to God what belongs to to God and they were amazed at him. Okay, now there's just some there's some minor differences between the two accounts, but that can be reconciled when we factor in that Matthew's gospel was meant for a Jewish audience, Mark's for a Gentile one. Otherwise, they begin with and arrive at the same conclusion. Now, apparently, the Sadducees and the Pharisees went their separate ways because it's the Pharisees who come back later with yet another attempt to trap Yeshua. Now, this time they bring with them another identifiable group of folks that our New Testaments call the Herodians. Now, history is vague as to just who these people were. Scholars have guessed that they were Hellenistic Jews, probably lived out in the Jewish diaspora, but they'd come to Jerusalem now for the Passover festival. That is, these were Jews that had been assimilated into the Greco-Roman culture. 
So they were Jewish supporters of the rather hated Herod dynasty. Now, clearly this group also had a problem with Jesus. Yet I emphasize that who they were is only a guess, since there is no recorded evidence to prove it. At any length, the Pharisees and the Herodians, we're told, they come to Yeshua with a question that involved the paying of taxes to the Roman emperor. They opened their dialogue with, we know that you tell the truth. Right. All right, and they conclude with, you're not concerned with what other people think about you. In other words, they're saying Jesus can openly speak his mind. And they're encouraging him to just be totally frank with them. Christ isn't anyone's fool. He knows that these snakes are trying to get him to say something against the emperor or to incite his followers to not pay the required tax, which could be taken as sedition. Either way, the penalty is crucifixion. The question as far as the Herodians and Pharisees are concerned is, is really pretty tricky and clever. When they say, is it lawful, or in the complete Jewish Bible, does Torah permit paying taxes to Caesar, it means, does it disobey God to pay that tax? That is, as a religious matter, should Jews be monetarily supporting a pagan Roman government even against their will? So the motive of the religious leaders isn't so much to get Christ to cite what the law of Moses says on the matter as it is to draw him out so that he states his personal opinion on the issue. This is a good time to pause and make a point about reading the Bible. And it applies to both Testaments. Whenever Jews or Israelites in general are discussing the law or what is legal, law means one of two things to them. Either the law of Moses or it means Jewish law, halakha, tradition. By Christ's era, these two meanings had become conflated such that it's only by the context that we can discern which is intended. And, and really, much of the time, Jews no longer made much of a distinction between the two. Here it means the law of Moses. The point being that whenever the Bible discusses the law or legality, it always means God's laws, not secular laws, not the laws of Gentile nations. There are a couple of exceptions to this, but when those exceptions occur, they are specific and they clearly are stated as being something other than tradition or the law of Moses. Now, such a distinction is not spoken, but it is implied here. According to the Pharisees, there is a Jewish law that says that Jews should not pay the tax. But there is also a Roman law that says they should. So, what should a good Torah observant Jew do? What would Jesus do? Little history. As it applied to the Jews, the Romans had two types of taxes that they imposed upon them. The first was called tributum soli, and that was a tax on produce from the field, stuff they grew, their crop incomes. The second was called tributum capitis, and it was a tax on personal property that everybody paid. And this second tax was usually taken by means of a census and seems to have been paid, it seems to have been paid kind of a standard amount of one denarius 
per year. Not, not a very large tax. Now, as small as the tax was, many Jews begrudged paying it because the Pharisees had declared it as against God's will and thus it was a sin to do so. This taxation was actually kind of rather old news in Yeshua's day. It had actually begun in the 60s BC, in other words, some 70 or so years earlier. About 25 years before the event now that we're reading about in Matthew, there was actually a Jewish revolt that began up in the Galilee in the Holy Land against paying it. All right? And no doubt it remained a major issue that precipitated the Jewish revolt that resulted in the sacking of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, around 40 years after Christ died. So, for first century Jews, this taxation was a, was a huge, it was a divisive, unsettled issue. It was not at all hypothetical, unlike another question about leveret marriage that would shortly be put before Jesus. Now, we should notice that in response to their question, Yeshua asks them to supply a coin, meaning he didn't have one. Why not? Now, since a denarius is not a large denomination of coinage, okay, then it was either because Christ and his disciples just didn't have any money with them, or because he didn't want to carry a coin with pagan imagery on it, which was as much the issue for the Jews as it was paying, uh, paying it as a tax. And since the Caesar was considered as divine, and at this time the Caesar was Tiberius. And also as the high priest, he was also the high priest of the, of the Roman sun god religion, the words Pontifex Maximus were inscribed on the denarius. And his image was imprinted on the coin with words that explained that he was the son of the divine Augustus. Thus, the more pious Jews were deeply concerned about even touching what they considered to be a graven image. Yet notice that Yeshua seems to have had no pause about handling that coin himself. Yeshua lets the Pharisees and the Herodians know, in no uncertain terms, that he sees through their ploy. And he calls them malicious hypocrites. And holding up the coin, he says, whose name and picture is on this coin? They, of course, answered the emperors. So Yeshua replies with the famous, well then, give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. But just how are we to take his meaning? I mean, it certainly caught his opponents by surprise. What, what could it have meant to the Jews that were standing there listening to this? Now, since this isn't a parable, but it's rather kind of a proverb, there are a number of things we can take from it that we can apply to our own time and circumstances. See, there are Christians today that see paying taxes to our governments as a religious matter, and thus they refuse to do so. Legally, in civil law in the West, such a claim has long, long ago been settled in court. It dismisses religious belief as any valid reason to avoid paying taxes. Now, there are others in the several Western democracies, especially in the 21st century, that harbor views on the matter of paying taxes that mixes politics with faith. And so they are deeply troubled that we should be forced to give any money to a government that imposes laws or regulations or policies that are starkly against our religious beliefs. But here, in my opinion, Yeshua is making the entire matter trivial. Trivial. Unimportant. 
That is, he's demonstrating that there simply is no godly reason to think that if your government imposes taxes upon you, that you shouldn't pay it. And this proves that at the least, Jesus was no zealot. He was no rebel. Nor did he seem to oppose being governed by Rome. I mean, when we back away and we look at this from the 30,000-foot view, we never hear of Christ criticizing the Roman government. We never hear of him involving politics in his teachings. Therefore, in his eyes, there is no conflict between being loyal to God on the one hand and submitting to a secular or pagan government on the other. Now, for those who followed Torah class in the past, you are aware that I've made it clear in several lessons that as much as we like, might like to make it so, the Bible is not an encyclopedia. It doesn't have a table of contacts. It doesn't have an index that leads us to answers for every question we might have. And as with the issue of God worshipers paying taxes to a pagan government, every difficult topic that is addressed is not so simple as yes or no. The answers can at times be complex and highly nuanced. That is the case here with paying taxes with Roman coins, because that's how they had to pay them, with Roman coins to a Roman government. And even by the Apostle Paul's day, the matter was still not agreed upon within Jewish society. So Paul explained his position at length on it, that no doubt is meant as a reflection of Yeshua's proverb. We find it in Romans chapter 13. I'll just read a few verses to you. It'll sound familiar. Starting at verse 1. Everyone is to obey the governing authorities. That's a big statement. For there is no authority that is not from God, and the existing authorities have been placed where they are by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities is resisting what God has instituted, and those who, re who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are no terror to good conduct but to bad. Would you like to be unafraid of the person in, th uh, in authority? Then simply do what is good, and you will win his approval. For he is God's servant, there for your benefit. But if you do what is wrong, be afraid, because it is not for nothing that he holds the power of the sword. For he is God's servant, there is an avenger to punish wrongdoers. Now, another reason to obey, besides fear of punishment, is for the sake of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's public officials, constantly attending to these duties. Pay everyone what he's owed. If you owe the tax collector, pay your taxes. If you owe the revenue collector, pay revenue. If you owe someone respect. Pay him respect. If you owe someone honor, pay him honor. Don't owe anyone anything except to love one another. For whoever loves his fellow human being has fulfilled Torah. Now what this all boils down to is that God allows preferences, but he demands obedience to moral issues. Although our morals, out of our morals, ought to flow, I think, most of our preferences. Taxes definitely fall into the preferences category, not into the moral. Some try to make taxation a moral issue, but only if they disagree with the current policy. Now, no doubt taxation can be intentionally destructive and feel completely unfair 
and unjust. Yet just as Jesus states in Matthew 22, Paul in Romans 13, you know, we can be deeply unhappy about taxation, but we are to suck it up and pay it. Not to misconstrue it as a spiritual or a faith issue. In the West, we can choose through our voting who governs over us and thus makes taxation policies. But as we all know, in democracy, our voting does not ensure that our preferred candidates will win and thus become the ones who rule. So whoever rules, whoever makes the taxation laws once made, as believers, we're obligated to abide by them. This is not opinion. Jesus said so. Paul expanded upon it to make it crystal clear. On the other hand, There will be instances, won't there, of clear conflict between government edicts and what God requires of us. Absolutely. And we live with this reality every single day. We can begin to resolve the conflict by giving to our government what belongs to our government and giving to God what is God's. Thus, money that's issued by our government would, in Christ's eyes, fall into the category of what belongs to the government. Civil contract law, even criminal law, in most cases, belongs to the government. However, our highest allegiance, our obedience to the highest authority, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may at times call for us to defy our government on clear moral issues. Here we go about that defiance. How we go about that defiance is just not explained. Now, I'm going to give you one such example that is front and center in America today. It's the very serious issue, very serious, of gender and sexuality. The government law that makes legal the marriage of two people of the same sex is patently immoral by everything biblically taught. That much of our society has accepted it as good and desired is one thing. That many of our Christian denominations have, or some segments of some denominations have, is another. To try to put a godly stamp of approval on gay marriage is wrong because it's immoral in every sense. Now, I've had numerous emails from folks about a person in their family who is gay and getting married to a same-sex partner, and some of the family is terribly conflicted on whether to go to that wedding to show love for that family member or to boycott it as a matter of faith in God. My answer is always the same. As a believer, you cannot be involved in such a thing. You cannot. Your involvement implies your assent to what is immoral and an abomination before the Lord. This sort of stance is going to win few friends, I promise you that. Perhaps even cause a rift in the family, but you know what? It's a price we pay for being a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Can't have it both ways. Yet that doesn't mean we have to now completely shun or hate that gay person. That's not what's, what I'm talking about. Yeshua sought out some of the worst sinners among the Jews. At that time, the worst were considered as the tax collectors and the prostitutes because they too must hear about God's love. God's love that so much wants them to repent and to obey Him and to have peace with Him. In any case, Christ's answer to the Pharisees and the Herodians oh, just set them right back on their heels. They were amazed at it. They had no rebuttal. 
So they left him. They walked away, no doubt, wounded and a little bit humiliated. Beginning in verse 23, we read of yet another encounter that Yeshua had with one of the spheres of, of, of Jewish religious authority. Open your Bibles again, and we're going to read it together. We're going to start reading at Matthew chapter 22, verse tw uh, 23. Chapter 22, verse 23. That same day, some Sarkim, some Sadducees, came to him. And they are the ones who say there is no such thing as resurrection. So they put him to a shila, a, a question. Rabbi, Moses said if a man dies childless, his brother must marry his widow and have children to preserve the man's family line. There were seven brothers. The first one married and then died, and since he had no children, he left his widow to his brother. The same thing happened to the second brother and the third, and finally to all seven, and after them all, the woman died. Now, in the resurrection, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all married her. And Yeshua answered them, the reason you go astray is that you are ignorant both of the Tanakh and of that's the Holy Scriptures and of the power of God. For in the resurrection, neither men nor women will marry, rather they will be like angels in heaven. And as for whether the dead are resurrected, haven't you read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzhak, the God of Yaakov. He is, not, he is God not of the dead, but of the living. So, this next group of Jewish religious leaders to confront Ye uh, Jesus were, re were representatives of the Sadducees. Now, these were the temple-associated Jews and were, for the most part, aristocratic. They were very well off. The core subject is not uh, hypothetical, but the circumstances they put forward to present it are highly hypothetical, and the core subject is about something they don't even believe in. Resurrection from the dead. So from the get-go, this is nothing but another fancy malicious attempt to try to make Jesus stumble. Their question very nearly approaches the age-old but silly how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. However, this short section offers us a great deal of insight into a matter that we all wonder about. Our afterlife, our own resurrection from the dead, and then into what state of being? Perhaps even when might it happen? When Christ is going, what Christ is going to expose is that this particular batch of Sadducees not only don't know Scripture, or how to properly interpret it, they also don't understand the power of God. I'm going to tell you up front that this subject and what Yeshua says about it is as deep as it is wide. Mark's gospel also contains this encounter. It's always wise to read it. So let's open up our Bibles to Mark chapter 12, and we're going to read from verses 18 through 27. 18 through 27. Mark chapter 12, verses 18 through 27. Them, then some Sadducees, Sadducees came to him. They are the ones who say there is no such thing as, a, as resurrection, so they put him to a Shelah, Rabbi. Moshe wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but no child, his brother must take his wife and have children to preserve the man's family line. There were seven brothers. The first one took a wife, and when he died, he left no children. Then the second one took her and died without leaving children. The third likewise, and none of the seven left children. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as wife. And Yeshua said to them, isn't this the reason that you go astray? 
because you are ignorant, both of the Tanakh and of the power of God. For when people rise from the dead, neither men nor women marry. They are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, haven't you read in the book of Moshe, in the passage about the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzhak, the God of Yaakov. He is the God of the dead, not God of the dead, but of the living. You are going far astray. So these accounts are very nearly identical. Yet by reading Mark's, it gave us the opportunity to essentially read this complex passage twice. Now, first off, the Sadducees don't believe in resurrection from the dead. Therefore, it will make it nearly impossible for them to accept Yeshua's resurrection that's just days away. Yet the subject isn't about Yeshua's resurrection, per se, but rather about the belief among most non-Sadducees that there someday would be a general resurrection of the dead, for them it meant of Jews. So when this passage talks about the resurrection, it's actually referring more to the resurrected group than to an event. Now, what did the Sadducees believe about death and what, what happens afterward? Well, the Jews is a culture didn't really have a universal doctrine about death and afterlife. They certainly didn't believe that after a person died, their soul went to heaven to be with God. Rather, the Sadducees, as did most other Jews, thought there would be some kind of a shadowy existence after death. But what it amounted to, where it happened, was mostly earthbound. That is, Whatever social status that one went into the grave with, this shadowy existence more or less lived out, was lived out on that same status level. And we have to be careful not to equate the Jews' thoughts about life after death with the resurrection. They're two separate issues. Now, the precise circumstance the Sadducees presented was leveret marriage and how that might tie to resurrection. Now, leveret marriage is a law of Moses. The leveret marriage law is that if in a marriage the husband dies before his wife produces an offspring, and really that meant a son, then the husband's brother, the oldest one, if he had several, must marry the widow. Then he must have a male child with her. Now this male child will be considered the son of the deceased man for the purposes of inheritance and continuing on with his family line. Okay? Now in Judaism, this is called Yibum. And what makes the sad this question all the more hypothetical and insincere is that this practice of leveret marriage was nearly extinct in Jewish society by Yeshua's day. So the circumstance they present is that a man gets married but dies before a male child is produced. He, his brother marries the widow. He too dies before a male child is produced. Same thing happens to a third and continues all the way until the seventh. And brother, he marries the six-time widow and he too dies before the woman produces a son. So the question is, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Now, the idea is to poke fun at the entire concept of a resurrection by showing there's no way it can work and still abide with the law of Moses. That's what they're trying to do. So it would be absurd to believe in it. Yeshua aims for the throat. He says, the reason you Sadducees believe this way is because 
you're ignorant of what the scriptures say and what it means when they're properly interpreted. He says that in the resurrection there will not be marrying. So the example they give is pointless. And the reason there won't be marrying is because upon being resurrected, the resurrected group will become like angels who apparently don't marry. Now, this opens this huge can of theological worms that the rabbis and, and, and Christian scholars have debated for centuries. Let's jump in. To begin with, Christ unequivocally says there will be a resurrection. As believers, we have no reason to doubt it. We have every reason to rejoice in it. Now, while we can debate exactly what our afterlife will be like and then what the resurrection, resurrection will be like, two different things, the fact that both exist is confirmed by Yeshua. Now, about this issue of angels and what resurrected humans will be like, I want you to carefully notice that this section does not say that resurrected humans will become angels. It's not what it says. It says that in respect to marriage, we will be like angels. And when the New Testament uses an analogy or it uses a parable to show how one thing will be like another thing, it does not mean that the one thing becomes the other thing. Perhaps a better phrase in modern English would be that when it comes to marriage, for resurrected humans it will be as if we were angels. Now the Bible is frustratingly short on information about angels. Now we know a few things about them, but most of what Christianity teaches as angel doctrine has actually come down from Jewish tradition. Now, because the original purpose of marriage was to procreate and to form a social unit called a family in which we raise those children, then it would be logical that once the resurrection occurs and we become immortal, the purpose of marriage evaporates. There's no need to marry and produce children because now people live forever. But what about the immense value of relationship and love within a marriage? Do the angels not enjoy that? Or is there something even greater to be enjoyed? In fact, are angels sexless? So someday we become beings without gender. Or does the way that God created the difference in humans, not just physically, but emotionally, even in gifts and abilities and roles, between males and females, does all that come to an end? Big questions, important questions. But the Bible's pretty silent on them. Some Christian commentators that are obviously unsatisfied with this lack of information, and who, like me, probably place huge value in a good marriage, commentators like Ben Witherington III, say that although Christ said there would be no marrying after the resurrection, it's what he didn't say that we ought to notice. He didn't say there would be no marriage. And he means that in the sense that if one is married prior to the resurrection and both spouses are believers, then the marriage bond would continue after the resurrection and for eternity. But if a person has never been married or had been married and was divorced or had been married to a non-believer, who of course wouldn't have been resurrected or at least not in the same condition and status as a believer, then the resurrected person was stuck being single forever. I think this is all reading way more into Christ's statement than what's here. Further, if what he suggests were true, then it would indeed make the Sadducees example of the Valeverite marriage of one woman to seven brothers a legitimate possibility and a dilemma. 
that had to be solved upon the resurrection. But Christ discounts it all. Now the Sadducees, all current information on them, seems to say, they also didn't believe in angels. So when all the evidence is laid down side by side, as tradition bound, as were the Pharisees, yet they seemed to have a more sound and biblically based doctrine than the Sadducees, who were supposedly experts in the Torah and went by nothing else. This is why it stung them so deeply that Yeshua told them how ignorant they were of the Torah. And as proof text, Yeshua quotes Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 and 6, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then he follows that up with, He is the God of the living, not of the dead. Sounds great, doesn't it? Man, that's a really tough statement to decipher. So does it mean the minute we die, God's no longer our God? Does it mean that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob really didn't die? Or is Yeshua saying that they're already in a resurrected state and they're alive in that sense or something else? See, here's one way to unpack what Yeshua has just said. The Deuteronomy passage that speaks of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob does not say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thus, since God is not the God of the dead, I was, He is the God of the living. I am, then in that sense, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. And yet in no way does Jesus imply that the resurrection has already happened. So in what sense are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob alive? And how are they proof of the resurrection? See, the context of it can only be in the afterlife sense not in the resurrection sense. And at the moment, the alive patriarchs are residing, or were residing, in Abraham's bosom, waiting for Yeshua to die and be resurrected as the first fruits of the resurrection, so they, along with myriads of others, could be freed from their pleasant and safe captivity and allowed to go to heaven to be with God. Now, despite my disagreement with Witherington over the issues of marrying, not continue, but marriage does, he does make an insightful comment that I'd like to quote to you. He says, in Matthew 19, we have seen that Jesus grounded normal marriage in the creation order, not in the order of the fall, which is the leveret marriage, which is a, that with the leveret marriage, instituted because of death and childlessness and the need to preserve the family name and line. Now, I'm sure you don't have Matthew 19 memorized. So here's what he's talking about. If we look at Matthew chapter 19 and we look at verses 3 through 8, it says this. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap him by asking, is it permitted for a man to divorce his wife on any ground whatever? And he replied, haven't you read that the, in the beginning, the Creator made them male and female? And that he said, for this reason, a man should leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two are to become one flesh. Thus, they are no longer two, but one. So then no one should split apart what God has joined together. And they said to him, then why did Moses give the commandment that a man should hand his wife a get, divorce document, and divorce her. And he answered, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives because your hearts are so hardened, but that is not how it was at the beginning. So even though the circumstance of Matthew 19 is really about dissolving a marriage, Yeshua explains the rationale for marriage and how due to mankind's hard 
hearts, things weren't like they were in the beginning, back in the Garden of Eden. Upon the fall, death entered the world. Childbearing became a necessity because the intended immortality of humans, poof, evaporated. Humanity had not only the duty of populating the earth, but also repopulating as replacements for the dead ones. Now, while I can't say so with absolute certainty, I think that the final chapters of Revelation teach us that upon the recreation with the destruction of the current heavens and earth and the formation of a new heavens and earth, the boundaries that currently exist between spiritual heaven and material earth disappear. The two habitats morph. They come together as one. Those seemingly impassable boundaries between the two spheres of existence, heaven and earth, are there to keep impure and sinful man from polluting the purest holiness of God. Heaven and earth will someday merge. There will no longer be a distinction between the two. And as it stands today, heaven is the angel's habitat, the earth is the human's habitat. But this is only a temporary condition. Revelation 21, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had passed away and the sea was no longer there. Also I saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride beautifully, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne say, See, God Shekinah is with mankind and he will live with them. They will be his people, he himself, God with them, will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning, crying, pain, because the old order has passed away. And then the one sitting on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. Also, he said, right, these words are true and they're trustworthy. We'll finish at Matthew chapter 22 next time.